Hi, I'm Tamitha Sko with your solar storm forecast for the week of October 11th. I'll begin this forecast by talking about Canada's recent frustration with Rogers Wireless because of the network outages that they began to experience nationwide starting October 9th. Now Rogers has since said that they've fixed these outages and everything's back to normal, but I'm still seeing people complaining about the fact that that's not true and they're still suffering problems. Now Rogers does not know why, they haven't let on yet, but it is interesting that it happens to be coincident with one of the biggest solar storms of this cycle. Coincidence? Maybe. But how about this? Juno was a NASA spacecraft that did a close flyby of Earth on October 9th in order to get a gravity assist out to Jupiter. Now it came in over Australia and did a loop around South America and then went on out. But during its closest approach around South America, it hit what's called the South Atlantic Anomaly. If I overlay Juno's trajectory onto that South Atlantic Anomaly, you can see that Juno actually flies right through the heart of it. Now that anomaly actually is the Earth's radiation belts that dip down deep into the atmosphere over the location in South America. And what that means is there are very energetic particles in there that then can cause havoc with satellite systems and cause it to do exactly what Juno did. It went into safe mode. It basically said, something weird's going on and I'm turning off. Now typically systems won't go into safe mode every time they pass through something like the South Atlantic Anomaly. But when you've had a really big solar storm, let alone a set of solar storms, that region gets bigger and more intense. And it makes it that much more likely that something bad will happen. So what happened? Why did the Earth system suddenly become so dangerous? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to September 30th, when this monster, this massive eruption on the sun, lifted off, taking up almost a quarter of the entire disk. As a matter of fact, its ribbons burned so brightly that it registered as a B-class flare. Now, this also spawned a radiation storm at Earth, but I'll cover that in a separate report. Now, when the prediction models came out, you can see this structure was massive, but it was going pretty much to the west of us. In fact, when you take the impact footprint and you flip it so that north is facing up, you can see we really do graze at what was really a much thicker structure. So as we turn to our stoplight chart, you can see it wasn't a very strong storm, but that's only because it didn't last. If it had lasted, you can see from our predictive KP index, it would have made it to 9 on the KP scale, which means it would have been as strong as the storm of the decade, which I'm showing you here. Even at that, we had stunning displays of aurora in the United States. Here's New York, but we had reports clear down into potentially Flagstaff, Arizona. Here's some gorgeous aurora australis in New Zealand. And I have to thank Corey Schmidt for sending this incredibly beautiful time lapse of aurora he saw in his own backyard in Iowa. But wait, there's more. While we were recovering from that solar storm, the sun blasted another one toward us. And it happened within six hours of a far side blast. As you can see, the models were showing that far side. But they didn't pick up the one that was going Earth side, so we were kind of flying blind. And a little bit more than a day later, the sun blasted another one at us. You can see the dimming regions here, but luckily this time the models caught it. This is Enlil, top panel density, bottom is velocity. You can see that solar storm coming out towards Earth, but remember there's a hidden one in front of it that we didn't catch. So it's going to be a one-two punch, and sure enough, that's what we see. The one-two punch with Storm 1 being much stronger than Storm 2. Storm 1 had a huge density spike and some very strong magnetic field that hit the Earth really, really hard. So as you can see here with the Earth's field, it gets really hit hard right there. And that gray line shows what the Earth's field would normally look like if there weren't any disruptions. But it was just incredibly ripped apart by these one-two punches. And all this disturbance led to beautiful aurora in Norway and in Russia, in British Columbia and Canada, and also in Iceland. So at this point, you'd think the sun would give us a break. We're already having potential satellite failures, and the Earth's shield is very disturbed. But wait, there's more. You've got this eruption off the east limb that you'd think would just leave us alone. But if you keep watching, there's actually a second part. This part actually lifts up and actually has an Earth-directed component. And once again, the models didn't catch it. Now looking at coronagraphs, you can see here's the first part that blows off, and up there is the second part. Now measuring the speed from these coronagraphs, we can tell the structure is moving really slowly. So we're expecting Earth impact somewhere on the 12th. And just when you think the sun couldn't give us any more problems, we zoom in on this region right here, and you can see right there that was an M2.8 flare that caused problems for Asia and Australia, the colored areas in that pic, for a couple hours. And this is all due to a couple active regions, especially 1861, that's very unstable. You can see all the mixing by the colors right there that tells you how unstable the structure is. And those are rotating more onto the disk, which means we have a higher chance of uh, M-class flares. NOAA is putting it at about 25% right now. So expect that maybe to intensify over the coming 
week. And don't forget the incoming solar storm we have on the, the 11th into the 12th. So this week may be a very exciting week in terms of space weather. And just don't throw your phone across the room or stomp on your GPS. Unless you want to. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching.